Okay. Good evening, folks. Catholic, Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by posting the same on the Bolden Board of Town Hall. I forwarded a copy to the Courier News and Scroll Ledger. At least 48 hours prior to the meeting, all the courts with the Open Public Means Act. This meeting will not substantially go past 10:30. Roll call, please. Mr. Here. Mr. Hall. Here. Mr. Perron. Here. Mr. Woodrow. Here. Mr. Pistor. Here. Mr. Kingsley. Here. Mayor Bruno. Here. Would you please rise and join me for the flag salute? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's nice to say that for the crowd. Yeah, isn't it? Okay, folks, tonight we're talking about the transfer of the property between the Church of the Little Flower and the Township of Berkeley Heights and the redevelopment plan for the municipal complex. I'm not going to read this whole thing away. No, you don't have to. Believe it or not. What's that? Can we read it? Uh-uh. Tonight's uh, speakers, we have uh, Mr. Mistretta, uh, Mr. Sordillo, Anthony Iovino from GRA Architects, and a Cardi and Ivino as architects and, rep and representatives from the library. At this point, let me just go over the ground rules once again. Uh, we will be having each speaker um, make their presentation, and then we will open to questions about that presentation, first from the council, then from the members of the public. Uh, after every speaker is gone in that sequence, we will then open up to general questions and comments about tonight's presentation and tonight's presentation only. We have uh, three more meetings scheduled uh, on the subject, and uh, there'll be ample time to ask uh, all, uh, all meetings on, on the subject. And as Mr. Perone pointed out to me, no action is going to happen tonight. Thank you, Mr. Perone. Okay, uh, again, just so we have a crowd here tonight, not as big as last week, but still a crowd. It takes a lot for some people to get to the podium to say their piece. We don't do catcalling, we don't do applause, we give everybody the three minute respect at that podium because it is difficult. Not everybody's a natural like me. Okay, with that I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mistretta. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Mistretta. I'm the consulting township planner for Berkeley Heights. Um, I'm just going to go over some items that I already discussed at the last meeting, but for those of you who have, did not attend last meeting, all of the documents that will be presented tonight are Sure. Oh, maybe I stand. It didn't work. Um, all of the documents that are going to be. No? Maybe I stand. There you go. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, sorry. Um, all of the documents that are going to be presented at tonight's evening are located in a three-ring binder. A copy has been provided to uh, the township clerk, so it's on record. And in addition, I provided uh, 24 CDs tonight. I apologize. At the last meeting, I provided them two days afterwards, and that's because it's just the volume of dra uh, drawings and documents in order to prepare was much more difficult. Um, tonight, I'm happy to say that I was able to bring them with me tonight, so they're available at no cost to the public. So if there's anything in a PowerPoint presentation or um, any documents that discussed, if, if you want a copy of, it's available for free on a CD at the Township Clerk's Office. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to focus on the library. You can hear uh, two speakers. Joe Sordillo, the Township Attorney, is going to discuss the Memorandum of Understanding and a subsequent resol draft resolution um, that's going to go in front of the Council, neither of which have been agreed upon, neither of which have been signed or, or executed. So they're all draft documents at this point. Then you're going to hear from Anthony Alvino from GRA Architects. Um, and uh, Iovino Architects, who's going to go through a PowerPoint, who's going to go through the whole uh, presentation on the library itself, the needs, deficiencies, proposed plans, etc. And then at the end, afterwards, we have representatives from the library board available if there's any questions that I'm not able to or any of the group here tonight is not able to answer. Um, there's an agenda that we handed out. That's dated September 22nd. It discusses uh, 
basically just a reiteration of what I said about tonight's presentation on the library. And you've also see, every, I just want to be clear, everything that's after tonight on that agenda is still in a draft form, but you see what's proposed for September 29th and the subsequent meeting October 6th. We're not going to get into construction cost estimates on a library tonight. We're going to hold those cost estimates for September 29th. The architects will go into the reasons why. It's very difficult to pull out one component of an overall project and I'll let them touch base on that. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce Joe Sordillo, who's a township attorney. He's going to address the two items, draft memorandum of understanding between the library and the township and the draft council resolution adopting the MOU. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, Mayor, Council, members of the public. Uh, my name is Joe Sordillo. I'm the uh, town attorney here in Berkeley Heights currently. Um, I'm here to discuss what has, um, we currently have, I, I just want to correct, we have agreed to a form MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with the Library. There's agreement on all the terms, we just haven't got a chance to authorize it yet. Um, what we have done is, if you remember, if you were here last week and if you weren't, one of the major items or contingencies in connection with this potential land swap is the library, uh, being the fact that the library property would be the property being transferred to Little Flower Church and the transfer of the library, the transition uh, or the existence and, and maintenance of the library during the transition period and the development of the new library space at the potentially new municipal complex. So because of that, we began negotiations and discussions with the library as to how that will occur. Um, as with the land swap itself, there's also many moving parts in connection with this subcategory, let's say, uh, with regard to the, the township and the library. Um, as I was mentioning, the, some of the uh, issues that are involved are um, what happens to the library when um, it closes, closes down. How much time does it take the library to, or I shouldn't, let me correct that, I should not say closing down. During a temporary transition period uh, when the property is sold or transferred to Little Flower Church where it might be a virtual or physical presence of the library in town during that transition period. Um, what timings involved, what storage is, is required, uh, what do we do with the equipment, books and so forth. Um, what is the design of the new library? Uh, the, this is a golden opportunity that if this moves forward that the library has to um, have input into how the new library would be developed and, and look and be designed to uh, meet all of its needs and future needs. And then lastly, the, the ultimate use and, and operation of the library in the new municipal complex because as uh, this will be not just a library building, this will also be the municipal complex. So there will be common areas and, and other areas that outside of the actual library area that will need to be uh, agreed upon on how they are being used, operated, and so forth. So at this point, we decided, that I say we, the township and the library decided to get together and negotiate and come to a memorandum of understanding similar to what was uh, prepared and entered into between the township and Little Flower Church. This would set forth the general terms, the general agreement give an outline on how to start moving forward and to try to get the uh, agreement uh, finalized if the land swap continues to move forward. Um, it's important uh, to note that the library, if you're not already aware, is a separate legal body from the township. It was a statutory body that was created when the township uh, authorized same by referendum. Uh, at the last meeting I, I mentioned that the, uh, there was a millage that the, my, uh, the library collects or the township collects on behalf of the library that's statutorily imposed and that was authorized uh, by referendum when the library was established. Um, that was um, uh, in connection with what one of the contingencies under the uh, Little, Flower, uh, Little Flower Township uh, me Memorandum of Understanding um, and that's also a key element here in this agreement as well. So at this point we have a draft agreement that has been um, reviewed and um, agreed to in principle by both parties so we feel comfortable to share that with the public at this time and there's a resolution uh, scheduled uh, to be adopted by the council at its um, October 7th council meeting and uh, the library will uh, 
look to adopt a, a similar approval a mechanism at its next board meeting, hopefully. Um, like I said, the memorandum of understanding sets forth the general terms, basically an outline of what needs to be done, what needs to be achieved, and the general direction on how to do that. Uh, so the terms of the uh, MOU as currently prepared are that the library will agree and consent to, this, to the land swap subject to certain following terms and conditions. Uh, one being the township's financial ability to complete the exchange and develop the new comp uh, com uh, complex. Uh, this is a very basic term. If the town can't afford or can't proceed to, do, to, to go forward with the land swap, there's no reason for the township and the library to, to proceed any further. Uh, the township obtaining ownership of the Little Flower property and developing and constructing the library space as pursuant to the agreed upon plans. Once again, a general term just stating that when the township uh, uh, purchases the property that it will develop it in, in accordance with the pl plans that are, are agreed upon by the library and the township. Uh, the library continuing to provide library services virtually and or physically during the transition period. Now, this is, a, this is a number of issues we're going to have to move forward and come to more specific terms for, but w one thing the township and the library are in agree agreement upon is that the library needs to maintain a presence in the town during the transition period. We don't know what that transition period is going to be. It could be six months, could be a year, could be a year and six months. It's just, it's just unknown at this time if this does move forward. So we need to have provisions that, uh, that we, the library still can, can uh, continue to provide services for the township and it's still alive and functioning during this transition period. Um, the, the township will work with the library to find reasonable storage space for the library's properties such as the books, shelves, desks, computers, equipment, and so forth during the transition period. Uh, even if there is a temporary, uh, a temporary physical location for the library during the transition period, most likely it will not be as large as the current library or is definitely not as large of a space as the library that's going to be. So there's still going to be uh, storage requirements um, in connection with the transition period. Um, the township will provide uh, at least 90 days notice prior to the um, closing of the sale and the actual uh, required vacation of the property by the, the library. This will give the library uh, sufficient enough time to make its arrangements to get the storage done, cataloging books and do what it needs to do to be able to vacate the property. And the library will have input in, in, um, with the township as to when that date will be, the closing date, because we have to make sure that it's, a, it's a feasible to the library and it's not just an arbitrary date that's imposed upon them. Uh, next, um, it was agreed upon that the li current library director, Stephanie uh, Bakos, would be the liaison with the township to try to keep a uniform collective um, approach to this so that it's, it's a, it's a, it, we have one contact person uh, to deal with with, reg in, in, uh, with the township. Excuse me. Um, also, with regard to the design of the new library, we want to make sure that the library has meaningful opportunity to provide input into what that library space is going to look like in the new com uh, municipal complex, uh, and that the final design will be subject to the library approval. Um, and then we have to, uh, ultimately, the library township in Little Flower uh, has to come up with an agreeable schedule with regard to the timing. Uh, once again, this relates back to the other point as to when the closing will be, when the land swap would actually occur, uh, schedule of construction, and uh, what the transition period will be. We, we, we're we not there yet because this is still a, a pending uh, possibility of whether we go forward, but at some point, if this does move forward and the, the land swap does proceed, we have to nail down as how long will the construction take, how long will this transition period be, and uh, how long will the library be uh, without its permanent location. Um, in addition, um, in exchange for many of this, the, um, the library agrees that it shall work with the township to get any required approvals and sign any required documentation to complete the transfer. Uh, the library shall uh, agrees to encourage the library foundation to help engage in fundraising es efforts to assist in the uh, cost of the project. Um, once again, we talked about the millage. The library agrees to help utilize the, uh, or to, agrees to utilize the statutory millage, which once again, that is the money, just for anyone who wasn't here last week, uh, that, that is the money that the township collects through taxes that goes to the library. It does, the township does not 
uh, maintain that money. Uh, that goes, it just collects it similar, like, similarly to what it does with the county taxes and with the school board and passes that along, but it's the library's funds. Now there's statutory terms of how they can use those funds and if there's any excess funds minus required savings that does get returned to the township uh, to go back to its operating budget. However, um, there are abilities and, and uh, permits that the library can use uh, that funding for even during this transition period. Uh, it can cover the cost of some of the uh, moving expenses, the storage expenses, and um, if there's any monies available towards the capital any capital improvements. There are restrictions, statutory restrictions on what it can be used for, but we need to work out exactly what those numbers are, what money, what amount of money there is available from the millage, and what can or cannot be utilized towards this transaction. The um, the library will be uh, agreed to utilize its own funds for towards the moving and temporary storage expenses, and the library agrees to during the um, transition period to maintain the uh, uh, only to maintain staff required during that transition period, and will fund the same through the library's uh, millage as well. Now, further, the parties agree to, once I said, this is a memorandum of understanding. This sets forth the general terms. This is not the final agreement. This is, does not set forth all the specifics. And the parties agree to negotiate in good faith to enter that final agreement that will govern all the specifics when it comes to the, the library's occupation and use of the new municipal complex, the design of, uh, of, of the new municipal complex, the use of the common areas, as well as all of the interactions and agreements that are necessary between the parties during the transition period. Um, and finally, the uh, memorandum of understanding itself and any future agreement may be subject to the state librarian's uh, review and approval as may be required by law. So depending on how these agreements mold uh, and, and uh, turn out to one, whether it's one agreement, two agreements, however they end up turning out, some of these uh, terms may be subject to approval by the state librarian as well. So it's another factor that we have to consider. But at this point, um, that is really all I have because it's, it's, it's very general. Uh, in terms and we're still negotiating uh, well we, we come to an agreement as to the final terms but until they actually adopt resolutions approving them they uh, can always be um, modified so just please note that when you take a look at the drafts uh, that are currently being uh, uh, distributed in the CDs that that is what the current terms that are agreed upon but once again until the final resolutions are adopted they are subject to change um, and that is really all I have at this time um, I'm Glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions from members of the council? Are there any questions from members of the public? Uh, Len Burkowitz, 140 Kent Drive. Maybe I missed it, but who's actually responsible for construction and renovation costs if a new library facility is being created? The township will be taking over the uh, the cost of the of the construction of the new municipal complex, but the library agrees to utilize whatever funds it can and has available towards it. Thank you. <clears throat> John Bonacci, one fifty six Gallatin Drive. Who owns the current property in the library and who will own it after presumed swap? Um, if you're talking about the existing library property is currently owned by the township. And afterward it would be owned by the church if the swap went yeah, forward. Yeah, if the swap went forward, yes. Yes, the, the church would take ownership. Carol Matula, 5 Hastings Road. Um, you said that the library would, would use some of its statutory millage for certain things, and you said that hasn't been decided, and you made it sound like you didn't know how much money was going to be available. The statutory millage is a defined amount, so can you give some better? Unfortunately, no, because we don't know what their expenses are going to be. We don't know how much. We, we, yes, we'll, we, this, the millage itself is statutory, but we don't know what their moving costs are going to be, their, pa their, their, uh, storage. their storage costs are going to be, their cataloging costs are going to be to 
catalog the books. It's not that a library can't just go in and throw books into a box and leave it. It has to be specifically categorized, and it's actually regulations that, that govern how it has to be performed. Um, whether there is space available, what that lease space is going to be, whether it's a virtual space, whether it's a physical space. There's so many factors that we just don't know at this time to be able to say, after you minus all those out, what might be left to be able to be utilized towards the actual transfer. Can, can you just say what the amount is that they get every year, or at least well, this past year? Well, it changes, year? and I don't, I don't know that number. Uh, Carol, maybe Carol, I, I, I believe it's around a million dollars. I just Maybe a little some, over, but right around a million. I just need to know some general ideas. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Hi, Michael Merlo, 40 Overhill Way. Now, the town owns the property of the library, correct? Yes. Uh, on the exchange with Little Flower Church, who's responsible for bringing the library up to code? Or is there a requirement for the building to be we're up to code on the exchange. We, we have a do right now. All we have is a memorandum of understanding with the with the Little Flower Church, and that is says that each party has their due diligence um, contingency. So, Little Flower Church can have its inspections of the property and and come up with a list of items as if with any any transition of property, and we can agree either to complete them or not. And if we agree not to, if we don't want to complete, do any uh, of the due diligence corrections, they have a choice whether they want to proceed or not on their on the current terms. All right, so if there's any re remediation for the library, I, mean, I don't know, is the library oil or gas heat? I, I'm I'm not aware. Stephanie, is it oil or gas? Gas. It's gas. All right, so there's no remediation as far as oil tanks or anything like that as far Hopefully. as the town being responsible for it. It's, it's an, a, my understanding is it's an as-is transfer. Oh, is so correct, it's as-is. Well, it's an as-is okay. transfer, but each party does have to do right, so, right. Right. So the do right. So the transfer is going to be as-is. It's, so it's, it's, it's no different than selling your home. Uh, you go into it as an as-is and then... Oh, no, you don't. No, you if don't. you have an oil tank in your home, you don't go in as-is. I'm as just saying you go into it and then if the seller could say, well, I'm not going to take ownership okay. unless you do this. And right. It's right. very, so very similar to that. It's going to be an as-is. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one, uh, Mr. Mistray, you want to move on to the next one? The second uh, speaker tonight will be Anthony Iovino, who's from the architectural firm of Acarsi and Iovino Architects, and he's going to do a presentation of the needs of the library and the proposed documents. Mr. Iovino, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here, and tonight what I'd like to do is to talk to you about your library, about the physical attributes of the existing building, as well as our findings on the functional needs of what an ideal library would be for this town, and a conceptual plan and how it would fit into the proposed building. So I'd like to take you through a few images and um, get to some data that we can talk about in terms of our findings and take you through the logic of how we got to where we are. So I have to assume that all of you, not most of you, but all of you are in some way familiar with your library. I like to say that in that my office does, probably we have done more library work in this state than any other firm. And I'm very familiar with how libraries function. I have a passion for libraries. <clears throat> and I think the best towns are the towns that have a very active library. So you know all about your library. Your library is just over 12,000 square feet. It is a two-story structure, which isn't the best thing in the world for a service type of a, of a building. And I have a few slides here with just some interior images, and I'd like to get to the data about the um, issues with your existing building. So this slide here, and again, Mike will have these in the binder that you can see them a bit better, especially in the back of the room. But these are on the upper floor. We have the main counter, the main service point when you first walk in, and that library has three entrance points, right? So it's up at the street level, about halfway down, and then around the back to the children's area. So this is the main entrance point, main service point on the left-hand side, and then uh, in that same area, just the small reading areas 
um, at the adults uh, department. These two slides are at the lower level. So your, your children's area was renovated just a few years ago. It looks great. It's a bit undersized. Um, it has uh, some other issues, but it's a good space. The image on the right, if many of you know or recognize, is the meeting room. It's kind of like going back in time a little bit in there. And we've had, with Stephanie, many meetings there over the years. Um, Stephanie and I go back a long time. Um, I'm involved with the New Jersey Library Association as well. So, you know, the goal when I walk into a library like that is what can we do? How can we make it better, et cetera? And, and there aren't too many towns that have the opportunity to potentially start from scratch, so. So what we have here, and I'm going to zoom in just a little bit, if anybody can read it from the back. Probably not, but I'll, I'll hit the highlights for you. Um, what we did was to look at the existing building. It wasn't you know, a detailed study, but there are easily identifiable attributes such as ADA issues, right? Um, every municipal entity, be it this courtroom, that library, your police department, at this point is supposed to be fully ADA accessible, barrier-free accessible. The grandfathering of that finished probably two decades ago at this point. Um, it's very important that that's resolved. There's no tolerance for that in a public building. If it's your home, if it's your business, it's a different story. So here we have the three entrances that I mentioned. Only the children's area around the back is an area where you can park on level ground, get out into your wheelchair or walker, right? It, not everybody in a wheelchair is what the ADA is about. Um, and get through a door without going up or down steps to get into the building. That's all well and good, but you can only go as far as the children's area. All right, so the bathrooms, no. The meeting room, no, because it's up the steep ramp. The rest of the library is up a set of stairs. Very important issue. So there's no vertical transportation. Um, the other parking space for uh, barrier-free uh, accessible pe uh, people would be when you first enter the parking lot, and if you recall it, it's a slope, right? So it's about five or six cars down. It's on a side slope. You get out of your car. You're supposed to make your way back up that hill to the sidewalk to go up the ramp to the front door. And in, in my quick calculation, even the ramp itself looked like it was too steep. So there are some issues there about simply getting into your own building. And there are other simple things, such as, and you might not think about it, but doorknobs, right? Um, they need to be lever handles. The ADA isn't also, again, about just being in a wheelchair, right? You can be disabled. You might not have use of your digits, of your fingers. So you can't turn a knob, right? So it's as simple as that. You, you can push down a lever, though, all right? So there are still some doorknobs left in that building. It shouldn't be the case. Safety and security items, very important for me uh, as a designer, right? So I look for places where, God forbid, you know, a kid could run out of the building or be taken out of the building, right? How does your staff monitor the entrance points? These three different entrance points are a bit of a challenge, plus there are two more egress points. So you have five different ways to get out of the building. That's not uncommon, but we could have alarms on the doors. We can have the doors in better sight lines to the staff positions, et cetera. So I, I think in an ideal layout, we would solve for that. Um, the meeting room and storage area is completely out of staff view, right? They're not locked doors necessarily. So if people are lingering behind in a meeting, you don't know. You're the last person to close the library. You don't know who's hiding in there. There's open storage cubbies and the kids could be in there and you wouldn't even know it. So th those are just functional items that can be easily solved with, with a new space. Um, there is asbestos in the attic. It's not a lot, but there's asbestos on some piping because we know that there was a, um, the need to replace some HVAC, which I'll talk about in a second. And um, energy items. <clears throat> it's a big thing to talk about in today's world. That building has single pane glass, uninsulated glass. Right? I mean, it's just when the building was built, that's what it was. Um, you would probably have a return on your investment in a matter of a few years if you simply put insulated glass in that building. The um, HVAC system, the air conditioning, ventilation, heating, really is not working up to par. The kids' area downstairs does not have air conditioning right now. It's just blowing tempered air from the outside. 
Um, in the meeting room, I know we had recent meetings there. Stephanie's laughing because it's like a jet engine. You, you literally wouldn't be able to hear me right now. And even in that meeting room, there are the old light switches that you press the buttons. So those are things, it, it basically says to me so far, the building needs some love. It needs some upgrading, right? It hasn't been upgraded since the addition was done in the 60s, I think it was, right? And then the last item I have there, last category, is about general and functional items. All right, so what does that mean? For, for me, the best library is where the staff can provide the best quantity and the best quality of services to the public. Getting into a two-story library where you have these hidden spaces and the staff are spread out probably costs you money because it probably costs more staff than it should or the staff isn't as effective as they can be and the space is kind of wasted that way. So your building is inefficient, in my opinion, in its layout. It's not ideal. It's what you have and you can make that work, but it's not ideal, that's all. Um, the meeting room, um, as I pointed out in the photograph, is a bit dated, very low ceilings, even for me. Um, the air conditioning is, is a bit of a challenge. The aesthetics are a bit of a challenge. The lighting is terrible. Um, forgive me, Stephanie. Um, you've had water infiltration issues, uh, including sewage backing up into the lower level. All right, so that's, mm -hmm. that's a real issue. I believe it's been addressed to a degree, but it's an issue you've, you've literally lost two bathrooms down there that aren't being reopened. And, and overall, the building needs aesthetic upgrades. It needs some new furniture. It needs more seating. Now, I said earlier that our office um, has done dozens of libraries around the state, and libraries are changing right now. It's really important to recognize that. Um, they are becoming the centers of the community. I don't mean that in terms of a community center in a recreational sense. I mean it in the sense of social educational activity. It's where people come together. The first thing we always hear when we talk about libraries is somebody will say, why do we need a library? I can get everything I want at home on a computer. That's true. You can probably get anything you want at home on the computer, but you're alone at home on your computer. And the social aspect is what you can't get at your home. When you come into a library, in today's library, a new and updated contemporary library, it's about facilitating those social gathering, those social learning aspects of a community. That's what makes a community smart and strong. And yes, there are still books, and yes, there will still be books for a long time. Um, if you went into a library, if you remember going back just 10 years, you wouldn't have seen CDs and DVDs, right? And, and in a few years, hopefully, all the VHS tapes are completely gone. Um, and probably, you know, in, in 10 more years, you won't see the DVDs. You'll, you'll walk in and do this, or you won't even, you can do this now at home, right? So, um, like I was at a library earlier today, up at Parsippany, and they're reducing all of their magazine collections way down because of Zinio. I don't know if you know what Zinio is, but the state does some amazing things through your library where they offer these services that you can get these magazines, these first-rate magazines at home digitally. But still, people like to come in and sit in comfortable chairs and talk with their friends and meet. Parents like to come in with their children and have these play dates at the children's area, right? Seniors love to come in and sit in, this, you know, in a sunny, comfortable spot with the, today's newspapers, a whole variety of them that are, personally, for me, I like reading books and paper rather than, I don't download anything on there, Stephanie, on my phone. But, um, so these are attributes of what is good in a new and contemporary library. So, going back, it's a year and a half ago at this point, that um, we sat down, our team sat down with Stephanie at the library, walked the space. Uh, I had been there several times before for other reasons and have been familiar with it, but we sat down and developed some notes as part of the bigger municipal study. We studied all of the departments for the town. Um, these two pages here, which again are going to be in the binder, are our notes from that meeting. So what I'd like to do is just touch on the functional issues that we, we hit on that particular day. So right now, the current staff at the library is six full-time and six part, 16 part-time, as well as some pages. Stephanie's counting. But it's down to five now, all right. So when I had asked, I said, what are your previous five years and what are your future five years? And there were no significant changes. One person isn't necessarily a significant change. 
but we see it staying about the same. Um, their hours, they have significant hours compared to typical libraries. It's nice that you're open on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, you get about 250 people through the door each day, typically. That's a fair number, and yes, that might be the same person coming twice, but that's great. You can come twice all you want. It's a good thing. Um, the uh, number of parking spaces, we account for about 12 staff vehicles, right? We, I said we had 22 altogether, full and part-time staff, so we yes, would yes. say maybe 12 would be there at a peak point, and the public, 33 cars on a non-event period. Um, and we, we come up with that calculation architecturally based on 400 square feet of library per car. That's kind of a zoning calculation. Um, I, I looked at everything from storage needs and special equipment. I'll for another pen over there. And uh, in this case here, we, we talked about functional items such as having a meeting room such as this that's open and flexible that can house at least 100 people, uh, proper lighting, proper ventilation, small quiet study rooms, right? What are those for, right? So a lot of library use in different communities are about language skills, English language skills, foreign language skills. Um, group study activity, that would be from young adults on to adults in college. Um, businesses come to libraries now that don't have conference rooms, and I know libraries that actually rent those out, um, but you don't have any of that, right? You have just the one big meeting room downstairs right now. So in an ideal world, you would have a variety of these meeting rooms that would be for board meetings, for community groups, for book discussions, et cetera. Um, more computers are absolutely needed, more storage is needed, better restrooms and everything ADA accessible. From there, what we did was to take that data and put it into math. What I mean by that is we looked at each of the departments in an ideal library relative to your library and assigned a typical square foot amount. I do that so that we get to a bottom line number and I know what a target is. It isn't the golden rule here on this. This is a target, right? And in your case, right, we're taking a target and putting it into a, a known building, so to speak, the, you know, the church building that we'll talk about in, in a moment. So here I looked at things, um, for instance, you know, there are no staff spaces in that building except for the director's office, which is shared by the bookkeeper. You have the circulation desk that I showed in that photo. It's everybody's workspace, right? And, and that's not how a library should be. You know, it should be a service point out there. You welcome somebody, it's a clean space, it's a comfortable space. Um, they're not talking on the phone with another customer, if you will, and a patron is a customer. Um, they can do business behind the scenes just like you would in your own business. Um, that's completely lacking. So we looked at a director's office, bookkeeper, technical staff, and then things like the adult spaces, the children's spaces, a separate young adult space. You know, there's that age group, there's that age group of kids that are in the early teens that unless they have their own territory, they won't even walk in the library. And that's a, that's a bad thing. You really lose them at that age. Um, and you can't put them in the children's area, right? So as many of you have kids, you know that if there's like little toddler playthings around, that's like kryptonite to a teenager. They won't go near there, all right? They'll go to the adult section. What happens there is then the adults in the adult section don't want that activity from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. to disturb them. So you give them a territory, a young adult's territory could be tiny, but something they call their own, something they attach to in terms of coming to a space that, where they can learn, where they can learn about technology, where they can learn to be respectful of others as well. So I think those are really important for a community to, to talk about all the full demographic, kids to seniors. Um, then we have meeting rooms, conference rooms, public restrooms, staff areas, storage, all the things that make up a library. We came up with a number including dimensions for the walls and hallways and things like that, mechanical equipment, that is 13,250 square feet. Your existing building, as two stories, is just over 12,000. I think it's 12,175 square feet. So we're not far off, which is a good thing. That's a really good thing. I, I would be surprised if we went through the math and came up with 20,000 square feet. It's not right. I don't think libraries have to be grandiose. I think they just have to be efficient, all right? Um, if you have a two-story building, 
you have stairs, you have elevators, all of that takes a huge chunk of space that isn't assigned to somebody's office or to your reading area or to part of the collection. So as an efficient one-story building, 13,250 is the target. Okay, so these next couple of slides are just to, again, get you familiar with the property. I know on the boards from last week, especially board four, the third one in from the left, shows the property. The one thing you know about, about this property, the church property is, and I want to point it out, is the large parking lot is the upper level of the school building, and then the property goes down to the lower level. Right, so as you look at the school building, um, it's this L shape. I'm just going to zoom into this. There you go. What, what's the bottom uh, brown L, if you will, is the school building. The upper piece is the existing rectory. So, and we'll talk about this in detail next week, but I want to focus just on the library right now. When we looked at all of the pieces of the puzzle, going through that same exercise I just mentioned for these other departments, the taking side. the 13,000 square feet for the library, we found that the bottom floor of the school, it's not a basement, it's completely above ground, is a perfect fit for that library. It's there by, it'll be there by itself, and all of the other departments would be on the upper floor. The library has different operating hours than municipal offices, so it's nice that then the library can operate freely on different hours, the bathrooms would be open, the meeting rooms, rooms would be fully accessible. And we, we laid this out, and I'll, sh I'll get to the detail plan in a second, so that you can have meetings like this in the library's meeting area, and the library can still be closed. So it's, it's a whole value-added design to it where the community now has more meeting space. Okay. There's no way on earth you're reading this from back there. Um, I'll, I'll describe it to you. It'll be in the, in the uh, floor plan. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to walk over there. And point out the attributes of the floor plan. In general, I'd like to say to you that the, um, when we design libraries, it's really important to design the space based on the flow. And what I mean by that is, I don't want to walk into a space and go to the circulation area, which is very busy, and people need to talk in a normal tone, not to instantly whisper when you walk in a library. I don't believe in that. Um, so it's active at the entrance, the welcoming spot. Um, from there, you, you want to sort of design from noise to quiet, active to passive. So the further points maybe in the library are quieter where you can go and get away, right? Um, and that's what we're doing here. And, and I'll point out that the uh, adults will be from, uh, to the left of the entrance and the children's and YA and active spaces will be to the right. Let me know if anybody has any trouble here. Okay, so um, this, this plan is rotating 90 degrees from the last slide. The big parking lot is at the bottom of this image, okay? So you know for reference. The, uh, the street comes out on this side here to the left of the image. There's a small parking lot down on this side which services what would be the library level for deliveries and staff. And all of the staff are in this wing here which is a one-story piece of the building. So all of the deliveries, the, the, the library takes deliveries several times a day for interlibrary loans, whether you're from home ordering a book from New Providence or the library doesn't have your book. Throughout the whole system, they can get that book from another library and bring it to your library. So that happens, that activity happens here. All of the staff would be anchored back there. The main entrance would be here in the middle. This gray area here is in addition to that school building. We're doing that because we need to add an elevator and a lobby and connect all of these different departments to one common entrance point. So the, you can access this library from the lower level walkway or the upper level, which we'll talk about more next week, and then come down the stair or an elevator into this lobby. This lobby has an outdoor courtyard that's completely enclosed. And what's really neat about that is we place the children's area around this courtyard. So the children's area actually opens up into this courtyard. The kids can't get away, right? So you have this outdoor room that everybody can enjoy from the lobby side and the children can actually use, uh, which is it's just a wonderful find. It's there and we're taking advantage of it. 
So you would come into the library here in the center. You would have the service desk, the welcoming point, the returns and self-checkout. All of the computers and tech would be right there within earshot and eyesight of the staff point, the welcome point. Behind that would be a series of glass-enclosed quiet study rooms. They're glass-enclosed because sometimes funny things happen in closed in rooms in libraries, and <laughs> Stephanie can tell you some stories about that. Um, but what's nice about it is it's there in the open. It's this more technology-driven image that would be as soon as you walk into the library. And by no means should this be a quiet space. Think of it like I'm sure. a tech bar going into an Apple store or a cafe. It's that sort of com community feel that it should have once you walk into the library. From there, this would be a solid wall. You know, the, the school building, if you remember it, if, if you've been in there, has a center corridor. And those black dots are the columns. So we're able to take a lot of walls down, but we need to respect the columns. So you would come in, you would come to this cross street, so to speak. Left would be to the adults. These drawings, uh, these items here are all the book stacks. Again, this is conceptual right now. Tons of seating, both tables and chairs, and soft seating. Everything would be powered up for uh, power and data. Um, and that would go all the way to the back of the building where, again, the service point would be to the staff. To the right as you enter, we would have what we call the grab and go materials. I'm here just to drop these off. I want to get some new books. I want to grab a DVD or a CD. All the audio visual, visual, uh, visual material would be right there. Beyond that, in an enclosed area, is the young adults zone. Um, it's enclosed, but could be left open. Depends on the level of noise, if you will. But it's also glass enclosed for those reasons I mentioned before. <laughs> um, opposite that here, in this L shape, that wraps around the courtyard I mentioned earlier, is the children's area. So you would enter here, and the children's area would have a service point, a family bathroom, uh, collection and seating and a separate programs area, that's where you would have story time for the, for the littlest guys, right? So the kids typically sit right on the floor. Um, and then on this side here, we would have sort of the in-betweens, not young adults, not toddlers, the middle group. Computers and tables and reading would all be here facing the courtyard. So you'd have a great amount of diffused daylight coming into the children's area. It would be a wonderful outdoor feel to this interior space. Um, at, the, at the end of the building, we have the bathrooms where they exist in the school right now, some storage for the staff, some mechanical spaces for the whole building, and then this is a large meeting space that can be divided in half. And it's not just for the library, right? It's for everybody in the town. But as I said earlier, this space, you can enter, you can get into the lobby and enter and use the meeting space and use the bathrooms, and there's a set of doors here that can close off the rest of the library. So I'm looking to design this in such a way, the way our team has it, that offers the town the most flexibility, right? We want everybody to be able to use these spaces around the whole building and not have a security issue. That's, that's a bit of a tough challenge, but what's nice about this building so far, and it was a pleasant surprise, is that it works. Um, the next slide that I'm going to show, Need to zoom out. This is my last slide. These are views of what our team envisions. It is not the final of anything. None of this is the final of anything. It's the beginning of something, right? So we had a vision of trying to make the school building not a school building, right? Not a church building. All of you have a memory of what this building is. It's different for me. Right, you know, I, I'm, I'm only, I've only seen it, you know, a dozen times per se. You've lived with it, right? So it's a school in your minds. Um, what we're hoping to do is to change some of that in how you approach the building, in this case, how you approach the library. And we'll talk again more about these images and other images I have uh, that we have to show you next week. But what I wanted to point out in this image up here, right, that's, that's the school building as it sits right now. And this piece in the middle, which is blown up here, is that elevator stair item I was telling you about. So you would enter from the main parking lot at this upper level or from the side parking lot at the lower level. 
and you'd get into this common glass lobby. I want it to be glass because that's your best signage that there's life in that building, right? You want to see in. Could, if you could imagine this almost this time of the night where you can see into the building and see that, yes, it's okay to go in there. I see people. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing. And, and if you would imagine, even, even before or after a meeting like this, there's nowhere to gather here, right? This is a space that would contain that activity for the other spaces in the building, which we'll explain next week as well. So within this lobby, we'll have the elevator, we'll have another bathroom, we'll have the stair to get from, from floor to floor. This is a view from the, ele uh, from the library entrance down below. And then this is the more detailed view from the upper level coming from the main parking lot walking to the lobby addition. So it's, it's a very exciting, it's for me it's a very exciting design because the pieces of the puzzle fit that school building better, much better than I expected. The, um, the library has autonomy, it has flexibility, uh, it's very efficient the way it's laid out right now. Um, we did present to the library board and we, we, we had a one-on-one -on -one with them in terms of what this could be. Um, I think it's, very, it's, it's well understood that the design is conceptual and will change. They always change. Um, and that's a good thing, right? You get to live with it. You get to test it out in your mind. You get to try and visualize how you would use it. Um, so this is the beginning of... of what your new library and what the municipal complex can be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ivio. Are there any questions from members of the council? I do. Yeah. Order, Anthony. Um, yes. If you can go back to one of your earlier slides, the uh, in fact the first one, if you would, please. Uh, where, I'm sorry, where, where you were listing the uh, ADA and all the there it is. Okay. Uh, the current structure. Yes. Where does it sit with respect to ADA compliance? It's not compliant. <laughs> so the, the answer is no. No, it's not. Not fully compliant. Okay. There are elements about it that are, like aisle spaces and such between book stacks, but you can't really get into this building the way you should be able to, and you can't travel within the building the way you should be able to. And those are, those are the primary aspects of ADA. Okay. A couple Mrs. of uh, The first, I guess I'm a little concerned about, it looks like this new library is only a thousand square feet bigger than the existing. Is that sufficient? Uh, I, I think it is. And, and while it is mathematically a thousand bigger, the existing building as a two-story structure has stairs. It has other inefficiencies about being two-story. The, the layout itself is not as pure as essentially the rectangle that we have to work with. So I, I think it's, it's percentage-wise, it's a small percentage increase, but it's a dramatic increase functionally. I, I mean, I understand because that does make a lot of sense to remove a lot of the things, but I guess I'm just, I guess comparing it to any other modern library that's being constructed this in this day and age, is there like a you know, is it relative to, I know at some point things were talked about that they're making libraries smaller. Mm -hmm. I guess my goal is if we ever got a new library that it should be bigger and being able to accommodate all things for the future that come up and more books that we can handle are gonna benefit the residents. So I guess I'd rather see a lot bigger library than just a little bigger. Okay. Well, I can tell you that in the sequence of events, the programming that we went through was done well before we laid that floor plan out or had the, even the size of that church building, the, the school building. Um, intentionally, I wanted to not know what I'm trying to fit this into because it taints what the target is. Um, and, and I was very happy to know that we could fit it in because, um, I, and I wanted to fit it all in on one floor. I was worried that we would have to distribute the library over two floors. Uh, but we found this mechanism to, to contain it on one floor, and it's actually, you know, it has borrowed space there. So, for instance, in the, um, in the floor plan, sorry, on the lower right where you have those round circles, that's the meeting room. The programmatic part of the library is only half that room. So the library is actually getting, you know, 
maybe another 700 square feet or so of space that's a technically assigned to other departments. So it's, there are these borrowed spaces that make it bigger than it actually is. And I guess the only other concern I have that I guess to me is a little trickier is the parking for it. Mm -hmm. You know, being that the only parking is just a handful of spaces on the bottom. Oh, no, no, that's, um, forgive me if it came across that way. Uh, the lower level, uh, the lower level parking is, is primarily for deliveries and staff. You can see down, down there on the bottom. We're expanding what exists there right now for overflow, but okay. it's about putting, you know, these 12 staff cars, deliveries, uh, they, you know, they'll have pages as well. They're, There'll be events when there are big meetings going on, and you'll need more spaces. And people will park there because it's closer well, than I guess, yeah, some of the upper I guess that's parking. where I, because most people, you know, want to, and a lot of times they just want to drop something, run in, and to have quick access and, and to me is very important. Right. But, yeah. you know, I guess the majority are going to have to park on the top, right. which. Well, the good thing about it is we have an elevator. Nobody has to take stairs if you're a parent with strollers. Um, if you're a senior, if you're in a wheelchair, you have the ability to get from any parking space on that site into the building and into the library without taking any stairs. Yeah, thank you. I would imagine, Mr. Avino, if, if you counted, maybe I'm wrong, but if you go, if you count the spots or all that, that low level circle, semicircle, and you count the spots in the present library, I'll bet you have almost as many there in that small space as you do in the entire library property where right, it sits right now. And then if you look at that space um, by the, uh, the base there where the elevator is, mm -hmm. right now there's not parking um, against the, that curb as it sits now. Uh, so you're, you're putting a whole row of parking right close to that walkway there. That's right. And, and the thing to remember too is that many of the library's events where we have larger gatherings are after your administrative hours. So the parking lot, you know, the, the peak load in the parking lot is covered. Um, and the same thing is true when you have planning zoning <laughs> events, et cetera, that, you know, have administrative things going on or there might, there isn't always library events going on every night. So the amount of parking that's on that site is amazing for um, a public building. Okay, I have one other question. You showed a slide, that I think it was your last slide. Um, there you go. That canopy, um, that goes uh, to the upper level entrance uh, on the bottom view of addition main entrance. Is there any way that 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 canopy can be uh, solar panels? Like we have it, uh, we have a, a, a concern town um, at uh, L'Oreal, mm -hmm. and they've done solar panels. That 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 site, if you look at it, uh, it's a very good artist conception, and there's not a tree that's above the roof line. So I mean, it, it looks like, and again, I know there's costs involved. But it looks like a tremendous spot for solar panels to help power the building and, and get put, more, put more power back into the grid. That's, that's certainly possible, Mayor. I, I would even look at, when we get to that point, the main roofs of the building yes. have, have tremendous area. Um, we'd have to look at the structural loads, et cetera, for that. But I, I think that has tremendous potential. Yeah, if there's, if there's a, a, a lease purchase agreement for 20 years where, right. I, I mean, again, I'm only familiar with when, I was, uh, when I was working uh, full time. Uh, we we had a thing from Sun Power where we, they put the the the, uh, uh, the the panels on there, and we actually paid nothing for them for uh, 10 years. And 10 years they uh, they got the benefit for the first 10 years, and then it reverted back to us. We got the lowest price of energy for 10 years. And I think it would be behoove us to uh, yep. at least look into that as we sure. uh, go into the planning stage. Especially when you're installing a new roof, that's the time to do solar. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you. Okay. Are there any other member, uh, questions from members of the, of the council? Members of the public, if you'd wish to ask questions, please come up, state your name. Three minutes. We'll be quiet. Washington Street. One, how much is this going to cost us? That's something we're going to cover at next, next meeting. Because it's really important, too. I was always taught, and I was raised that you're quiet when you walk into the art library, that it's not a social space. I think it's safe to have the children in the basement of our library 
all buildings in this country can be made safer, not just our library. You don't need glass to be able to see that someone's in the library. You go to the library to study, to learn, to get reference, and it's a myth. A lot of people don't have computers or one of those smartphones. Libraries are very important to a good half the people, and this is not a city, you know? We're not Summit, and Summit did a beautiful job with their library, and it's two stories, sir. It's just, um, our library, I think it's fine, it just needs to be remodeled. Lucille, you know? I, have to, I have to interrupt. This is a time of questioning Mr. Amadeo, uh, uh, Mr. Amadeo, Mr. Avino on his, on his presentation. Well, I didn't it, question him on his presentation. I'm questioning him on the need for the library. At the end, library. we'll have a, your general comments are at the end. You don't need glass to say someone's in the library. Libraries speak for themselves. We're all raised to use them. They're a resource. So your question you, is? You know, and you don't need it for meetings. We have schools, auditoriums. You're shoving this down our throat. We're going to raise our taxes just so, like they so want to So your question do. is? Snyder Avenue. How much is it going to cost? That, then we will discuss that next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> John Bonacci, 156 gallons, and I have two brief points, Mr. Alvino. Quite a bit of detail there. My recollection, <clears throat> as well as uh, Councilman uh, Woodruff and uh, mayoral candidate Woodruff, is that the millage mentioned also was uh, and around 1.13 or something, it's about a million dollars the last half a dozen, dozen years. I can't conceive how much of that goes into reserve for anything major, so that I can't see much money coming back to the town, although in the year 2010, uh, about $60,000 did come back, something on that order. I was against it, by the way. Now, so I don't think you can count on any of that. And then, uh, which, uh, What's being done, it relates somewhat to Councilman D'Elia's comment in your extensive drawings. Around the country, <clears throat> it seems like there's a lot of the concept is for a combined library and community center. And you mentioned a little about rooms and extra rooms, but I didn't hear the concept of a major community center. So I would think that would change the whole expanse of this. And although we're not talking about money, the 1.7 million that the church then provides to the, the town provides to the church, I'm confused now, the 1.7 million, it would seem like it would take all of that and more if you were to combine a library and a community center. And I think your plan should readdress the idea of a library plus a community center. And then that would have a great uh, impact because I think Mr. that's Mr. what's Mr. being Panacci, done. Excuse me, I, okay. I hate to interrupt you because you're on a roll. The question, we need a question yeah. about his presentation. The question is, can you consider a library plus a community center? <clears throat> and I know you're not into cost today, but is that going to really uh, drive the cost up? Because the difference, the transition cost must be appreciable. And uh, if the town is going to own the building, I don't know where you put the dividing line between the, the, the building, which is going to be owned by the town again, and the transition costs. But I would think you got to continue to operate the library. You're going to have transition costs. It's going to chew up that whole million dollars. So if you were to take the concept of a community center, what does that do to your uh, plan? Would you just scratch that whole thing, or would you pound out the upper end there? and? And add sufficient facility. Well, the, the, um, I, Thank I you. think you'll get some of that answer next week when we're able to show the rest of the building. Folks, I'll remind you of the audience again. This is a time to reserve for questions on Mr. Iovino's presentation and his presentation Oh, thank you. Michael Merlo. I like your idea, by the way. That's not a question <coughs> about the solar. Oh, and I like it, too. I thought, let me answer. I like it, too. I do, too. Uh, my question is, is there a movement with these new libraries now, with the conference rooms, with corporate sponsorship? So as you're renovating this library now, you're going to put in these conference rooms. Can you get corporate sponsorships to pay for some of this? I've never seen a library say no to anybody offering money, but... Uh, I mean, do you, I mean your, yeah. your expertise yeah. is libraries. I Absolutely. mean, do you see that happening more and more? We, we do. We do. And it's not, it's not just corporations. It's community, right? So the, you'll see the libraries go on an extensive fundraising uh, drive to find everything from, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with, you know, selling bricks, right, for paving. But you'll see, if you look closely in different buildings, you know, a plaque over 
you know, a, 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 room. a room, right? A small reading room or table and chairs, a bench, bookshelves. Uh, I've seen libraries go pretty far with that. And it's a double-edged sword, though, too, you know, because years later when you go to change something, you're, you have a bit of an issue when you have somebody's name stuck on something. But um, I think it's a great idea. And the more support you get from businesses, I think the healthier the, the library is. Too. Now, you have conference rooms planned in this. Set. Thank you. John Sakaglia, at 22 Robbins Avenue. At the school, the existing HVAC systems, um, are they compatible with what you need to do both for the library and for the offices? No, they, they would be fully removed. So they would hold to total replacement, okay. Secondly, are there any asbestos issues in that school besides piping, like in the walls, wall plaster, any of that? I, I believe it's floor tile is in, and uh, some ceilings as well, yep. Okay, so, so that there's a remediation, would be a remediation cost for that as well? Yes, but yeah, and that, that, I don't know what the numbers are or who's responsible for that, but I think we'll talk about that more next week. Oh, so that might be uh, an issue that be, as far as the swap is concerned, that the church might have to do okay. something? It's just another attribute, just like the current library has discussed some types. You know, every, every building that's, that's it, that's it. that was built before 1970 has something in it. And, you know, depends on the severity. But that's just another factor in you know, like the gentleman asked about oil tanks before. It's just another factor in the as-is condition of any building. Okay, so my concern was, though, in terms of obviously you're going to be taking down a lot of walls. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, is whether or not that those walls require remediation. I mean, pipes is another story. It's a lot easier to remediate no, it's that. It's primarily uh, floor and ceiling, not a wall issue. Okay. All right, thanks. Hi, Linda Rudiselli, 33 Dell Lane. Um, I'm sitting in the back, so I couldn't really see everything. Can you show me where this library staff room is? Sure. Can you show me where the library staff room is? It's on the leftmost part of that extension. That little extension? The little extension, the one story extension on the school building. It works well for deliveries and the activity that's been so is there a kitchen in there? There is. Uh, there's not a kitchen there because on the right-hand side where the meeting rooms are is a pantry for the building. So, the, the, so the, the library staff don't have a separate kitchen per se. So we're sharing a kitchen area, a, uh, like a um, break room. Exactly. Well, the, the pantry is where you go on, on the break is a different story. You have it. You have the ability in the back area, you know, the conference room, like my office, and the conference room, it's the lunch room. It's that kind of thing. So, so there really isn't a library staff room. Right. In that current configuration, there isn't a library lounge, per se, right now. But again, that kind of feedback is, that level of feedback, I don't have just yet on this floor. So this is still to come. OK. But, you know, what, what about else? bathrooms? Oh, well, we have a, the public bathrooms are there. We have a family bathroom. Uh, I don't have plumbing on the left-hand side where the staff offices are right now. And I'm not, ideally, from the money point of view, I don't want to add the plumbing out there. Do we have that? All right, I stand corrected. Because I don't know the school building that well. I know the footprint of this building. OK. If there's, a, if there's plumbing out there, there would be a bathroom. But will that be for the staff or for the public? No, that will be in the staff zone, if that's the case. Right? Staff zone. So, but that's not where the break room is. That's just right, like a receiving a area, like a room. So where is um, the Stephanie's office? <laughs> so we're going to take a break in front of Stephanie's office. Those are things we can, we can work at. We haven't gotten to that level. Because, you know, I like to do my thing in the break time. Um, what about the tech room? Where's the tech room where we're going to process books? Tech, tech room and, and interlibrary loan are in that, that zone right there. When you first walk in, um, when you first come in from the outside, deliveries would be right there. And so we're processing books and orders, and we're taking a break, and Stephanie's office is in that little space. It's not that little. It's not that, it's not that little. It's How big is that space? Uh, it is 60 by about 24. 16 by 20, 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. Right. This, this room we're in is 
<laughs> okay. That so that section over there is that, and that has the potential of being broken down differently. Okay. Um, but let's see. I think that's it. Thanks. Perfect. Carol Matula, 5 Hastings Road. Um, I know you're not presenting anything about costs this week, but did you figure out the cost to remediate the library to make it ADA compliant? Will that be available for us? Yeah, that was a part of our charge was to, to do that. Okay. Um, and then the um, bathrooms that are in, in the school now, are they ADA compliant? No, but they will be. Okay. When you did this design, it looked like you looked at global needs what what communities typically want and what's did you um did you ever do you ever do just you know consider any specific makeup of a community when you do when you make these plans and yeah, and then our greatest asset is the director of the board staff which we need to talk to some more even um you bet i i'd like to say that i know libraries very well but every library is unique every town is different and so some towns have many more kids and they want greater children's areas and have many more seniors, like Monroe Township, which, which we work on. It's almost all seniors. It's 50,000 square feet and it's most of it's about senior spaces. Um, you know, so every community is different, but the attributes, the aspects of the library are the same, just how we put the equation together. Was there anything specific about this town that you incorporated in this plan? We wanted to make the children's area safer and bigger and more attractive and welcoming. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had more seating because those were more of the complaints that, that I recognized from the library. Um, meeting space, flexible meeting space, different size groups, not just 100 people, but 4, 12, etc. So it's about flexibility so that the building the library staff, the services, can respond to the change in, in library services as the years go on. Uh, Fred Dambra, Archer Lane. Uh, when you started your presentation, you, you made a comment, not every town has a chance to start from scratch. And as you went through your presentation, this obviously is, is a retrofit. M my question is, if you indeed really had a chance to start from a blank page, is, it, how close is this to what you know, we would end up with? Pre pretty close as a diagram. I mean, obviously the shape is dictated by what's there, right? I don't have a blank canvas, but I have a nearly blank canvas, right? I have the skeleton of that building. Um, you know, as an architect, one of the hardest things is when, or an artist, you know, give me a blank piece of paper and, you know, blow your mind, but um, at least for architecture, we have property limits, right? And, you know, in New Jersey, there's rarely a property I ever came across where, you know, it's so big, we can place it anywhere, we can make it whatever we want. Um, what I was talking about early on in the presentation with the program, the, where we came up with the 13,250, was an ideal setting, right? Um, an ideal setting is a one-story building. There are towns that do new two-story buildings and new three-story buildings. It's because their land is a postage stamp and, and likely a more urban environment with limited parking, so there's a balance. Um, if, if I had this piece of property clean, no, no buildings on it, it would be different, but if you were to look at it as a diagram, it would be similar. If that, if that makes sense. Designing from active to passive, from noisy to quiet, would result in a similar diagram. So in, in a sense you're saying functionally we would not have something less That's or greater? Right. Functionally I think I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely pleasantly surprised with how we got this to lay out within that building. I don't feel it's compromised. Thank you. <clears throat> Tom Lenahan, 231 Lorraine Drive. I didn't see the main entrance for the general public from my angle of it. Could you show me that from here? No, I, don't, I, don't, no, I want to see the floor plan. Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's in the, like the. Well, it, it was on this. I had zoomed into it. Mm -hmm. 
main entrance. There, there are two entrances into this lobby. This lower level here, the upper level, which is not on the screen, the okay. entrance here. And everybody would come together and go into the main library entrance would be there. Okay. Now, that level is now mostly grass, correct? Down here? Down here, right. That's right. This is all pretty flat when it's up against the building as grass. Is there any plans to put parking down there for easier access? No. Not at the moment. Not at the moment because it's, you know, it's such a nice setting for it. I'd rather not, you know, I'd rather not have cars right up against the building if we don't have to, but we need to look at the overall picture. You know you can do it. That's what's nice about the right. property. Um, you can't do it around the backside because the, the ground gets wetter and wetter. Um, ideally, I'd rather have green space up against the building. So you're looking out at green space from your, from your library rather than parking lot. Yeah, I'm just thinking that from the parking lot, it's an uphill walk. In wintertime, there's snow, there's ice, there's rain. That could be very slippery and dangerous. It is. It's actually a level walk everywhere because from here and up to this level, is le uh, from this walkway is flat. And you go up the elevator, and this walkway is flat. Yeah, but the parking lot out there is limited where the main parking up top, mm -hmm. there's a retaining wall. There's a hill. That, <laughs> it's it's at that. least 100 it's feet to the main entrance. On the curb, yes, but 90% yeah. of the parking on the, in this parking lot, most parking lots, is flat. There's the just parking, but to go from parking. that upper parking lot, it's a distinct it's hill. It's a road, right. Oh, yeah. we, we showed about maybe six spaces on that. Yeah. And I mean the main, I mean where the auditorium church is up there in that parking lot is really going to be your main parking for that whole site. Right. Now it's not that flat, it has a slope to it, yeah. drainage and all, but it's not a hill. What do you think of our ADA and elderly people? That's kind of dangerous, so it should have I some parking, it. you know? Yeah, I think it's... It's much safer you know. than what you have now. Because you talked about the handicap spot of the existing one and you got to walk up a slight hill. No, That's right. slight compared to this. That's not as steep as this one. <laughs> Yes, I beg the difference, but thank you very much. If I can interject for a second, the, the, the walkway that goes from the, the main parking lot into the, the center entrance area, does that walk into the second floor, so to speak, yes. or the first yes. floor? Yes, second floor. Second floor. Second right, floor. so in fact, that pathway that goes from the large parking lot into the, the that, that is perfectly flat, correct? Perfectly flat. Yep. And this area here is flat. Exactly. Okay. And then you take the elevator downstairs to enter the library. That's right. Okay. Richard Leister, 49 Summit Avenue. I'm just wondering what exactly, you must have an exact number for the total square feet for that area. For the dedicated to the library. Is dedicated to the library. Exactly, yes. uh, and I, I don't remember hearing what it was. Okay. 13,140. Right here on the slide is 13,140 square feet. So okay. We're, we're right there. And so that excludes the common area is what you're saying. That's right. So this, right. Sorry, this gray area is not included. The courtyard's not included. That stair's not included. The meter room's not included. The bathrooms are not included. Mechanical is not included, half of this meeting room is not included. The rest of this and half of that is the third right. thousand okay. the program, program spaces of the library. So that, that was my point earlier, is that right. there's so much more to it than, than just the target. The other question I had was uh, the windows on the building. Do you have any plans to change the windows? And can you talk to that point? Um, not exactly because that's the extent of our drawings we have right now. We do know that we're going to be energy efficient, insulated glass. Um, you know, when we get to that point, we need to talk about um, availability, budget, et cetera. All those things come together, whether it's going to be a green building, et cetera. So, thank you. <laughs> Tom Foriger, 14 Dorsey Road. Why does a library need windows? Causes glare. No, not anymore. Not in today's computer monitors. Not at all. They used to say that for fluorescent lights, but and everybody who put those darn attachments over their screens, you don't see that anymore because 
the technology on the screens are, are such that you don't need it. The glare isn't there on your screens. Thank you. Bernice Foyer, 70 North Road. Um, I ran a technical information center, so I know a little bit about libraries, and I also know about how difficult it is to uh, redo them. But I'm looking at it, and I see that about six, one sixth of the space is used for the front lobby and the atrium, which is giving up a lot of valuable space. And so I was thinking that maybe the atrium could be made smaller and also the, where the uh, circulation desk could be moved into the lobby area and it would give you a lot more library space. Because what you see now really doesn't give much chance for you know, expansion of those bookshelves. And you know, you'll say, why do we have this, this area? It's really one sixth of the, the space that we see on the plan. So it's lovely aesthetically, but maybe you could pull everything forward, make your atrium a little smaller, and bring the circulation out. Right into this area. Bring all of this right. down yeah. into here. Well, I, I, that's just my suggestion. I see what you're saying. I, I like the way you're looking at it. Um, we'll certainly look at it. You know, uh, that lobby, when you see the rest of the building, you'll see, too, that, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure we have the lock-off points. But there are some things that could be outside of that. I think what you're talking about is having that welcome point, you know, get those areas outside so you can have more function inside. Exactly. I'll take Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I guess all the questions have been answered or asked. Anthony, thank you very much, Mr. Ivan, for your presentation. Mr. Mistretta, you want to wrap this up? Or do we have any more? We have one more. Hmm? Oh. We're going to have um, a public comment period where. Absolutely. Where anybody from the uh, public could make any comment on tonight's presentation or a statement or so forth. I just wanted to make a, uh, take a moment to inform everybody, if you didn't pick up the agenda, the next meeting is September 29th. A lot of the questions that you have regarding cost, September 29th is the cost meeting. We're going to get into detailed discussion of the, you're going to see the rest of the municipal complex, all of the architectural drawings on the municipal complex, police department, etc. All the other facilities that are proposed. You're going to see detailed cost estimates for each of the improvements. And then we're going to get into, tonight there was a, a question about environmental aspe uh, 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 asbestos uh, removal. You're going to hear uh, part of the documents that will be submitted will be an asbestos abatement cost estimate and report prepared for uh, the campus that you just took a look at. Um, and then there's going to be a summary of the project cost of the overall development so you can see the numbers at the end of the day. Then on October 6th, What's going to happen is that'll be the final meeting, at least that's the final one where there's scheduled presentation as of tonight, and that'll be a discussion of the draft redevelopment plan. Essentially, we come back to this property here. What's this property going to look like? What is the density? What type of land use? What is the expected municipal revenue, et cetera? So we come, on the 6th, we come back to this property. If everything was relocated to the church campus, we talk about the future of the municipal complex and the redevelopment plan. So that's the conclusion tonight. If you want to open it up for I'm going to open it up to a member of. Mr. Mayor, I, I just have one question. Did anyone from the library want to be heard? I am going to open it up to a member of the library board. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody's jumping the gun here. Mrs. Kohlenbeck, thank you for, uh, Mrs. Kohlenbeck is the president of the library board and she has a uh, statement she would like to read. Good evening, members of the town council and the public. Uh, I just have a few brief comments I'd like to make um, because I believe that uh, our township attorney and um, our architect spoke very eloquently about um, the memo of understanding between the township 
and the library board and also the plans for the library. Um, I'd like to read to you all the vision and the mission statement of the library. The vision of the library is for Ber Berkeley Pike Heights Public Library to be an informational, social, and cultural resource for the entire community. And our mission is to deliver information, social, and cultural resources serving all residents of our diverse community. And I think everyone on the library, I speak for everyone, by saying that we believe that a new library building as part of the land swap is the best way for us to fulfill our vision and mission for the community. Uh, the building that we've been in has certainly, I've been a member of the board for about 13 years now, and uh, it's been a building that's been less than ideal, serve the needs of the community. And it's also been an expensive building to upkeep. And so to the extent that we could uh, assist the community and dedicate funds subject to uh, statutory requirements to develop a new space for the library that would have adequate meeting space for all the different groups in the community, adequate um, library resources. Uh, the library fully supports uh, the land swap and the development of new library space. Thank you. Mrs. Coleman, I thank you very much for your staying appreciate it. Right, yes, ma'am. Thank you. I wanted to address the public too, if that's okay. <laughs> My name is Lavinia Boxel and I'm the president of the uh, Berkeley Heights Public Library Foundation. We have been around for several years waiting for a project such as this um, to, to marshal our efforts. I'm a professional fundraiser. I've been with, at Rutgers University for 18 years. And you know, there were questions about corporate sponsorships and other things. Absolutely. That's that uh, individual sponsorships, corporate sponsorships. It's not going to underwrite everything. This, you know, I had the privilege of being a member of the township committee for a year. These buildings, these facilities are our town. They represent you. Now, you all might think that they're fine. Not, there's a lot of us that don't think that they're fine. This is our greatest investment. This is our town. I grew up here. I'm raising my family here. I'm back. And this is a project that we all need to get behind. And the library is central to. I think you did a wonderful job representing what a library means. And it's a resource truly for everyone. And I don't think we all realize what it, what it can be. And I would say that the fundraising efforts, the Library Foundation Board is prepared to marshal, you know, I'm a professional fundraiser, you can't fundraise for something unless you have a plan. And what's very exciting now is we have a plan with naming opportunities and other things. But this is a project, this isn't for someone else to fund. I'm not saying everyone here has to give $1,000, anything like that. But this is a project for the town to get behind and embrace and be proud of. And it's incredibly exciting to look at these diagrams and see what could happen here. So we, we're ready and fully supportive of this project and putting our ideas, weight, and muscle behind fundraising for it. Thank you. Axel, thank, thank you very much. He will, that's okay. We give courtesies to former committee men, women, persons. Anybody on the council want to make a statement before we move to the public? No. Okay, it is now open to the public for general comments about tonight's presentation. Um, you know the rules, three minutes. Um, state your piece and we will listen. Thank you, Gerald Kuzmik at Eaton Court, Berkeley Heights. I heard the presentation as everybody else did, but I did not hear too much of a addressing senior citizens accessing this new plan. As you all observe that you have approximately 20 steps from where you park your car to the entrance of the current library. No place on this facility, or I have I heard, senior citizens being addressed as having a very short distance from their car after parked into the main entranceway. 
and I'm very concerned about the fact is that senior citizens use library a lot. But I didn't hear too much accent relating to the seniors of accessing the facility as the plan describes. As you know, the footings and the foundation currently exist at the little flower complex. And there is a walking more than 25 or 30 steps as the current library exists from where they park their car to where they're going to enter the building. Is there some sort of uh, arrangement that can be addressed relating to seniors and their walking distance from the car to the entranceway? I didn't hear anything relating to seniors being addressed at this presentation. May I have a comment, please? Anthony, can you go back and show the slide with the parking in the front of the building? Because I do believe there's parking right in front of the uh, upper level uh, with the walkway there. There you go. Okay. If you look at the, um, the building at the uh, base of the, there's, there's parking there that's not there right now. Um, no, no, I'm no, talking about the top. The front, the front, there the front you go. Is right there. Now, what, what, what is the yeah. distance? What is the distance between that parking facility and the main entrance, the walking area as such, compared to what the library currently exists? Well, I don't know that. Yeah, I, I don't have the absolute number, but I can tell you that these new spaces here, which are being added to that parking lot, this first row, are about the same distance that you would have to walk from the current parking lot. I'm talking about the closest ones to the library, not the ones in the back of the library, um, to the building. The added walkway that I think you're after is what that balance would be, and that's probably another 50 feet or so. It's a long way. It's, it is. It's walking. I mean, you're right, but again, the current existence of the grade from the parking lot is a slope more or less, and the, and, and the position that I'm, I'm kind of bringing to your attention is that what exists ex currently, as I said, is approximately 35, 40 steps from the car to the main entrance door of the library. You're doubling it or tripling it on the, on the print that you're showing me here, plus the fact is I think more addressing to seniors relating to accessing this building than what I have heard. Well, I think there's a better access to this building than the current library because you're not walking up steps. It's level, and it's, it, I don't know what the, the square the uh, the footage is from those new parking spaces in, but um, I'd venture to say this is this is a better deal. I mean, there's not that, if you go to the current library, there's not that many spots on the side. Where you're talking about the 25 steps, there's only like five spots. You're and right. You've got to go to the back. So no. there's more than five spots on the bottom side, which is a short walk, and there's more than five in the top that are very level, that keeps you on one floor where nobody's having to go up and down stairs. So I think it's definitely more the library, senior friendly. The library is going to be located on the lower floor of this current structure. Correct, Correct. but there will be an elevator. So you will come in and you go down. down an elevator. You'll never have to go up and down stairs, which is not true today in the current library. That's true. So. I understand that. But I, I still feel as though you have a, a, a larger distance for seniors to cope with on the plan that has been presented. That, that is true. We'll take a look at that. Thank you. You just see him as something can use the exercise. Hi, Lisa Kolbeck. Um, I have to agree with him 100%. Address. Address. Uh, Killarney Stay Drive, address. Berkeley Heights. Um, having a senior in town who is a, uh, my mother, who has gone from a cane to a walker and now in a wheelchair. Um, up five years ago, she used to go to the library and take out books with her cane. There's no way she would be able to walk with her cane from that parking lot to that lower le level. Not to mention, now you want them to go from that parking lot to that atrium which it, to get to the elevator, which is even further. And then if they would park up top and walk in the other entrance, it's way too far. 
for a senior to with a cane, a walker, and then if, even if they had an aide with them with a wheelchair, it, it's very far to be um, senior friendly for the access. So that's Excuse me, if I may, maybe. Anthony, is the term senior friendly, which I think we all understand, okay, mm -hmm. is that synonymous with ADA? I mean, can they not be one and the same? I believe they are. Yeah, that's, it, that's why I asked the question. You know, it, it, we're talking also about distance to a door, but not distance to your destination within a space. I, I, I think there's no denying that it's further from the parking spot to the front door. But, you know, that isn't just where you're going. You, you know, you would be around the library. And if, if you know, if you, in the current library, if you're there and children and, and your parent, you're on two different floor levels. Um, you know, it, it's a hard thing, it's a harder thing to control in that environment. And I think that a layout, whether it's this layout or any other layout that's all on one floor, fully accessible, is ideal. Um, if we were starting from scratch, like we were talking about earlier, and had an empty site, and we were building a new building, the situation would be different. The parking spaces would be even closer. But they're as close as we have them right now. We might be able to, to bring the ones on the lower level closer, and we still need to look at it. These are wonderful comments for us to hear because it helps us make that better. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. That building itself, the layout, I think it's fabulous. I'm in favor of the whole project itself. But I just, and it's first-hand experience, it's, and it's recent, but I just know that um, it was wonderful that she was, they still be able to drive and get out of the car with the cane and walk, I don't know, however many feet that was to that door and go up the four steps, because she could, and still return her own books, because then I didn't have to, you know? But because I'm telling you, she would have drove in that parking lot and looked, right? Dolores, my mother, would have done that, right? So she would have drove in that parking lot and said, I'm not walking that far. So, and then you're going to cut out a lot, a lot of seniors that would want to go. And even though that's a great space, they're going to just see the space and never be able to get into it. So. You know, but that's only one portion of our community. I know there's a lot of other people that can walk in that building and enjoy that great building. But I just think it needs to, I would it'd be very sad to, to eliminate. Well, one, one of the things we can do, and we, we haven't had the benefit of the conversation either, is to have, you know, senior assigned spaces that are at that lower level closer to the building. So those are things that we still need to, to discuss, but it's those kind of comments that make us more aware of it. Yeah, I mean, go to a senior meeting and <laughs> <laughs> that's how you're going to get the best feedback from the seniors. Okay, thank you. I, I just have a question to that point. The, on, on one of your other schematics, it showed that there was parking on the side of the building where the meeting was. <coughs> is, is, it, is it possible that seniors could into the library through the side of the building which is facing the police department? There. Well, that Di would be perfect. Diagramma yes, it is possible. Diagrammatically right now, it, it, that piece of that puzzle has to do with the police cars. But by all means, this conversation leads to those solutions. I have a question. Where is the handicap parking? It's if they're there, the darker slots that you see there. So what's the, is it's there, the closest, how close do they have to be to the building? They are the closest spots to the walkways right now. And, and you know. Are there guidelines as how close they have to be, or they just have to be the closest spots? They should be the closest, and there's a quantity guideline based on, like, we have 100 parking spaces, X number need to be accessible. Okay. But based on the community, if we know we have more senior users for the library or the other spaces that are in the building, we can add more, right? So, you know, it's that balance that we still have to develop. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Matula, 5 Hastings Road. Is there a basement under this first floor? It's on a slab? Okay. And then as the second floor has the, um, so, so this floor is perfectly capable of holding the weight of books and everything. And what about the second floor? Does that have, is that able to carry the weight of offices? Yes. Um, 
I notice on this chart that GRA Architects is on the left and then your firm is listed on the right. Um, who's doing what on this? We're working together. My office, sorry, I don't know if you picked it up. My office is working with GRA Architects. Okay. We're, we're brought in because of our expertise in library design and police and administration design. So is, is this your design or is this GRA's it's design or? Team's design. Okay. All right. Thank you. Paul Faraguna, 175 Park Avenue. Um, I just want to make a quick comment. Um, I understand that there's going to be additional meetings where. Uh, the remainder of the plans will be outlined in, in greater detail. But just to speak for tonight as far as the library and the land swap, it's almost as if it's being presented right now as, you know, getting behind the land swap and all that means is a new library. But there's a great deal more involved. If it was just a matter of supporting a new library, I don't think there would be much of an issue. And the design issues as far as senior accessibility and whatnot, those are all things that can be worked out. Okay, but it's much more than just a library. If it was just a library, I think this would be a fairly easy matter. So there's a lot more th to consider here. That would be true. Thank you. Clapping. Uh, Stephen Yellen, 130 Dogwood Lane. Um, my question for Mr. Iovino. Um, in your experience for a new facility like this, Barring anything unusual, what is the average, is there an average lifespan of such a, a building before it's say there'd be need for a serious repair or? Um, you know, for a public building, regardless, library, administration, police, uh, you know, I think a target is like a 75 year window. Usually things get changed for functional reasons before they do for physical reasons. But in terms of stability, in terms of the physical stability of the building, we're talking about something that could go all the way to the end of this century, roughly. So the year 2100, a facility of this kind would be physically? With, with proper maintenance, yes. Any building can. I mean, look at York, right? How many years are the building? Hundreds of years old, right? And as with all the cannonballs trying to knock them down. Yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, sure. Uh, uh, Fred Damber, Hutcher Lane. Uh, my question is, does anybody know if the church has ever experienced any flooding on this property over the years? I can't answer that. Let's speak for the church. It's a wetlands. We know there's substantial wetlands. Right. No, sir, I, I don't think anybody here can speak to the church ever. Um, all I can tell you is uh, I'm not aware of any time it, it flooded. I mean, obviously, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't. if there's potential for flooding, that, that would be a disaster Eddie. for the town. I, I to have our speak a little infrastructure bit. on a floodable place. I'd be no. Just so you know, from the site survey, this dark line, that's the 100-year flood line. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the 100 year flood. What about the 500 year flood? <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't think I'm going to be alive to see it, but, you know. Be careful. Well, the 100 year flood lately has been coming every 20 last years. Three years. Yes, I know. I, I could also speak and say for sure that since I was a kid, Roosevelt Avenue probably floods at least once every other year, uh, some years a lot more. And Roosevelt is, even though it's not the only road to get to this, it is an issue and it's a problem. And when that floods, I don't, I doubt it gets to the building itself, but it gets at least to all the grass along the side of the building. That's why it's so green there. To the, to the western side of the building. But the main problem is the bridge goes under constantly. Uh, Tom Lenahan, 231 Lorraine Drive. If I may, on this parking and access, to the, uh, the building and make two possible solutions. One would be the easiest is to put parking right in front of the main entrance that you propose for the public. It might be nine, 10, 20 spaces, I don't know, but that would go a long ways. The other way is to put your grand entrance on the other side, if I may, move it just slightly over to this side, 
can't. You can't. Because of the wetlands. You can't. It's, it is. Okay, it's wetlands. If that's if that's wetlands and we pave it, I, I would say we're asking for some trouble. Oh yeah, you could. It's Positive. wetlands. Yeah, it's yeah. wetlands. That's not my line. Right up close to the building, within 30 feet. It's impervious coverage. You don't have enough of the no. entrance. No. It yeah. seems like you put at least one row of cars. But you can't put the entrance. Yeah. What you need is a door. Oh. Something to think about. Yeah. That's why, it's an folks, idea. that's why we're having these means for the input. We, we've we crossed all the I's and, and, no, we've crossed, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's we know about. The reason for these meetings is to get this kind of input so we can take it back to the architect and plans and say, hey, how about what Tom said? Does it work? So I appreciate all the input. We're not saying this is far from a done deal. That's why we need these meetings. We want this to be input. So thank you. Hope I didn't kill anybody's, uh, oh no, okay. Uh, at least, uh, Len Burke, once again, uh, 140 Kent Drive. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things, uh, possibilities. Obviously, a lot of moving parts. And I thought part of all these studies was to compare the costs of fixing up in place versus the cost of the new facility. Is somebody looking at the cost of uh, bringing the library up you're to a, code? You're a week or two early, Len. But, but it is, uh, because this gentleman said he didn't look at it, but somebody else is. No, no, I, Len, I, I think in the, in the uh, following meetings, there will be a, a complete discussion with regards to entertaining this, this migration versus uh, yeah. correcting and modifying the existing yep. properties. There's the headline story, shyness in Berkeley Heights. Uh, <laughs> is there anybody else who would like to speak? I'm inviting it. Okay, nope. seeing no one. Uh, Mr. Mistra, you, you already did your closing? Yep, that's right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from members of the council? No. Nope. May I have a motion to adjourn? I'll motion. Second. Mm -hmm. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Folks, one more thing. Hold it. Yeah, I know I did. Now I'm on a journey. Um, next week's meeting, please pay close attention and call town hall or look at the papers. We may move it to a bigger venue because I think we're going to need a bigger venue. Last week it was standing room only along the side, so we're going to need to look at the high school, look at the middle school as a place for our meeting. So if you get here at 7 o'clock and see no cars, give us a call. All right, but please, we'll, we'll get the word out as best we can, just so you're aware. Thank you.